this was across the trail. We saw these folks in their backyard, and uh, this was kind of down the embankment from the trail. And I noticed the sign, and they built their own gate so that they could access the trail directly from their own backyard. And uh, I said, wow, she, where'd you get this sign? She said, well, I used to work for the city of Charleston and was instrumental in getting this path funded way back when. And I was, and I'm so excited to live on it now. And I had one of these old signs in my, you know, like office file cabinet that they put up some recognition of the Greenway on their gate. And I just love that. People feel a lot of pride of place when they live next to a facility like this. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Brent Bice, a manager of South Carolina and Georgia for the East Coast Greenway Alliance. And we are having a discussion about the East Coast Greenway and his area uh, there in Georgia and South Carolina, and what really is a greenway <laughs> and, uh, and how they are really pulling together this amazing three thousand mile route from Maine all the way down to the tip of Florida. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Brent Bice. Brent, it is an absolute joy to have you uh, here on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good to see you again, John. Yes, good to see you again. Um, you have been featured uh, before in some of my video work uh, back in 2018 when I was in uh, Savannah, Georgia for the CNU. Uh, I believe you had mentioned it was CNU 26. Is that about sound about right? Yeah, that's right. I remember yeah, well. So, good times. Well, you and and so you were leading a, a, a workshop, a, a bike workshop, and I was trying to remember the name of it. Was it like riding through back in time. Do you remember? What yeah. Was riding that? through history, uh, living here and riding my bike around, you realize pretty quickly, if you pay attention to architecture and, you know, transportation policy that Savannah, uh, is kind of like an ice core sample, you know, from yeah. the Arctic where the city was founded on the banks of the river in 1733 and then grew due South. So yeah. every five to seven blocks you travel South, you're traveling towards the present and uh, wanted to show that off. It's a pretty unique setup uh, compared to a lot of cities. I love it. I love it. In fact, you know what I think I'm going to do is uh, re-release that video here on YouTube uh, so that folks can see that. So it'll be like a, a little uh, flashback in time. Uh, Brent, one of the things that I love to have uh, my guests do is uh, give them the floor and just have them introduce themselves. So let me turn it over to you. Who is Brent? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much a Georgia boy. I'm uh, coming to you from Savannah, where I've lived since 2014. Uh, prior to Savannah, I lived in the college town of Athens, Georgia, go dogs. Uh, and before that grew up in the kind of undifferentiated suburbs of Metro Atlanta. Uh, so consider myself a Georgian. Um, I got into these issues in college, like a lot of people, I was riding my bike and walking and using transit uh, as a broke college student and had sort of unarticulated frustrations with sprawl development and the, and the soullessness of oceanic parking lots and chain restaurants and retail um, from where I grew up and seeing a different kind of setup in Athens where they preserved their pre-automobile business district and then the campus itself that was leafy and old and very walkable, uh, that contrast got my head swirling on those issues. And it was really a couple of books and then one event put on by a local advocacy group that changed the trajectory of my personal and certainly professional life uh, forever. Um, and it was The Geography of Nowhere and Jane Jacobs, of course, uh, very eye-opening. And then I attended an event in Athens uh, called the Tour de Sprawl uh, in 2002, way back when. And it was put on by a local advocacy group called Bike Athens, who is still out there. Shout out uh, to bikeathens.org, uh, doing the good work to support transportation choices in Athens, Clark County, Georgia. And I, I really had a lot of light bulbs go off about development, land use, why aren't there bike lanes and sidewalks and protected paths, greenways, uh, to make it easier for people to get around in a way that doesn't require a privately owned automobile. Uh, and I remember uh, just grinning ear to ear and thinking, wow, now I've got a vocabulary 
to, to describe my frustrations and the things that I'm seeing that I didn't feel good about. Um, and of course, this is 2002, and we were poised to begin a second war in Iraq that clearly oil was a big part of that. And so this was micro issues of my own experience growing up in the suburbs being connected to issues of uh, global politics, uh, geopolitics and, and warfare and strife. So really kind of the full gamut, right? And it felt very important to understand these things. So I went up to a volunteer, uh, I'll never forget. And I said, hey, this event was so cool. How do I get involved? And she sheepishly looked at the ground and looked at me and said, oh, you want to be on the board of directors? And as a uh, young man with no background working in nonprofits, I jumped in uh, head first. And lo, six years later, I was the president of the organization. Um, and then that put me on a path that led to working for the statewide bike advocacy group that ultimately led to me working for the Alliance. Yeah. I'm going to pull up the, uh, the, the website here of the, the place that started it all for you. Right, <laughs> bike Athens. Right. Yeah, and again, yeah, that's bikeathens.org. Yeah, I think the very first time I met you, you were with the state advocacy organization. And, mm -hmm. uh, and what year did you join the uh, East Coast uh, uh, Greenway Alliance? 2017. It was after I'd moved okay. to Savannah. And okay. they had uh, gotten to a position to hire their first ever dedicated staff person just for advocacy in South Carolina and Georgia. And uh, it just worked out with timing. I moved to Savannah for personal reasons, was already here running the statewide bike advocacy group for Georgia. And so was certainly aware of the East Coast Greenway as the project for the entire coast of Georgia. And a lot of people are like, Georgia has a coast? Yes, we do. It's 160 miles long, uh, gorgeous barrier islands and some really cool historic towns on the mainland, lots of beautiful rivers and marshes. Uh, well worth a visit. But yeah, a lot of people don't don't think about Georgia having a coast. And uh, we do, in fact, have beaches. And the Greenway connects all those mainland cities, uh, Savannah, Darien, Brunswick, and St. Mary's uh, being kind of the chief among them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, you and I were talking about this uh, before we hit the record button. Uh, as part of my Savannah trip, uh, I was able to, to ride, a two-day ride, uh, starting in... Uh, Gosh, I guess it was uh, what's on the other side of um, the 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 bridge from uh, from Charleston. Uh, on the far side, the north side, that would be the town of Mount Pleasant. It's kind of a sister city of Charleston. That's where we started was over on yeah. Mount Pleasant. And we there was a development over there that we wanted to take a look at. And uh, and then we rode across that bridge. Of course, that's one of the notoriously dangerous bridges, or at least it was back in 2018 when I was there. Um, and then into, into Charleston and then, and then, you know, made our way through the, the low country there. Is that, that, is that correct? Is that the way you describe it? The low country? Yeah, absolutely. From Charleston okay. to the South is the low country. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, heading South, uh, to, uh, making our way to Savannah. So it was a two day trip. Uh, I think there was between 12 or 14 of us and uh, a, a, a di additional people would come and go. And uh, we, we did go through Buford and we did um, have uh, some mayors meet up with us and, you know, chat with us and, and all that kind of good stuff. But I was really impressed by segments of that route because it was on the East Coast Greenway. So why don't you explain a little bit about what the Greenway actually is. Mm -hmm, sure. So the Greenway is an ambitious vision for a 3,000 mile corridor of connected uh, multi-use paths, paved, uh, asphalt, concrete, boardwalk, uh, and protected bike lanes in urban settings with adjacent sidewalks. And we're really trying to stitch together a continuous, usable route from Calais, Maine, all the way to Key West, Florida. Uh, the vision has been around for over 25 years. It's uh, about one third complete. We want the entire route to be on fully traffic separated, all ages and abilities type facilities, uh, with the default being a you know 10 to 14 foot multi-use path. 
Uh, goes by a lot of names, right? A shared use path, a greenway, a rail to trail where it's built on an old rail corridor. So it has a lot of different looks and feels depending on where you are. Uh, the greenway is one thing in Manhattan and another thing in rural coastal Georgia uh, and then runs kind of a whole gamut in between. Um, and so a lot of it's been developed in the Northeast and in Florida. Uh, my region, which is Georgia and South Carolina, is definitely the furthest behind in terms of completing segments of the Greenway. So I usually describe it to people who are coming here to check it out as it's it's the good, the bad, the ugly, and the missing. You know, there are <laughs> really, really nice segments that end abruptly. And if you really wanted or needed to continue walking, running, or biking from that point south or north, you may be on a, you know, divided four-lane rural highway sharing the lane with fast-moving logging trucks. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, particularly in the rural areas between the cities. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and and as you had mentioned, yeah, there's waterways. So sometimes you're you're making your way across waterways, and uh, sometimes you're you're literally on a, a nice paved, separated path. Uh, and and this looks like it's following uh, along a, a, a canal of some sort or irrigation. Um, you know, tr- yeah, uh, that's channel. in Beaufort. Uh, this is a yeah. really beautiful ten mile rail trail uh, okay. that is called the Spanish Moss Trail. Connects Beaufort and the town of Port Royal. Yeah. And as I mentioned, sometimes you're making your way across bridges like this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which the bridge? It's called the Arthur J. Ravenel Bridge that connects Charleston, uh, the historic peninsula of Charleston, to Mount Pleasant. And that's been a barrier protected path since the mid 2000s. That's one of the oldest pieces and and very beloved in the area. So this is, I I don't want to call this, well, I guess this is a, it's kind of a national thing in the sense that it's an East Coast greenway, you know, like I said, all the way from Maine to to Florida. Uh, But so this is a a really a large, ambitious uh, initiative and effort. And uh, so there's a headquarters office. Where is that headquarters office? Sure. The headquarters is in Durham, North Carolina, which is approximately the midpoint for the entire route. And so a little over half of our team, there are, I have to fact check me, but I believe there are 13 of us total. uh, And over a little over half of them are in the headquarters. And then the rest of us are field staff like me who are assigned to the advocacy for a state or a couple of states if the states are smaller. And what do you actually do? A lot of cheerleading, a lot of going to to meetings, uh, talking to social and civic groups, elected officials, and sitting in on those public information open house type meetings that South Carolina DOT, Georgia DOT, and county uh, public works departments are holding, where if they're touching any part of our corridor, we want to make sure that if they're widening a highway, which they probably shouldn't be doing, but that's often the work that's happening, (laughs) or resurfacing a road uh, or a new development's coming in where we might be able to get, you know, all or some of the East Coast Greenway segment developed there. We want to make sure that we've got a voice that is clear and persistent, uh, polite, but diplomatically uh, encouraging them to make sure that the Greenway is part of their plans. And then we share lots of information and resources, certainly with the new infrastructure bill and all this funding uh, that's that's being distributed to the states. There are a lot of opportunities and alphabet soup of funding programs for people to navigate. And we help them do that specifically so that they can build sections of the Greenway. Right. Yeah. Uh, Has the route actually been uh, mapped out so we know roughly where the the route is going to go? The vast majority of it has been mapped out and we've got it at least at the county and MPO level. It's been formally recognized uh, in every coastal county of Georgia and South Carolina. We're hoping that eventually we'll get some state level buy in. Some of our neighboring states like Florida and North Carolina have really robust and impressive DOT managed uh, aspirational visions for multi-jurisdictional kind of trails that connect cities. And right now, Georgia and South Carolina do not have those kind of plans. And the East Coast Greenway would be a a really big part of that plan, obviously being the the route linking uh, all of the coastal cities in both states. Right. And then for the the entire route, uh, uh, 
you had mentioned that, you know, Georgia and South Carolina are, are slightly behind, uh, pretty much, uh, the, the, the mapping and the routing is, is has been, uh, taken, uh, taken place on along the, the further North and, and further South into Florida already. Yeah, definitely. There's a really sophisticated level routing and planning that's even gotten down into the the corridor alignment. Uh, The further northeast you go, the the truer that is. Got it. Got it. And it it seems like there is, you know, it's kind of cobbling these things together, as you mentioned earlier. And we we talked about that. It could be uh, a an old rail trail corridor it could be, you know, following, uh, you know, the water line uh, could be on street. So uh, it, it seems like, yeah, the, the, that opportunity you'd mentioned, you know, we shouldn't be building more freeway miles, highway miles. Um, but it, it, if that does happen, I'm wondering if you are opportunistic and saying, okay, well, by the way, if you're doing that, we need a, a you know a, a shared use path over here. Uh, is there an opportunity for us to do that? Do you is that sort of the game that you're in? Is somehow looking to try to leverage those uh, dollars, mm-hmm. especially if they're federal dollars coming into the state level? Absolutely, yeah. We're we're as opportunistic as is appropriate, and sometimes you know we'll have a vision that's been in place at least conceptually in a county, and they really want the the greenway to be on this abandoned rail line or some other corridor, but there's been zero political will or funding or movement towards developing that corridor, and it seems like a really heavy lift. Uh, Politically, uh, it might just not be palatable. So when, uh, so for instance, Camden County, Georgia, uh, the DOT was widening a highway to four lanes, mostly as a very practical measure for hurricane evacuation uh, for the coastal communities. And since they were going to be doing that work, it made a lot of sense for us to advocate for a 10-foot concrete multi-use path adjacent to that. And we were successful. It took some goading and uh, several different local elected officials to let the DOT know that that mattered to them. But ultimately, the DOT agreed. They slightly adjusted their cross-section plans, and we ended up getting almost a four-mile stretch of the Greenway completed through that project a couple of years ago. So I see in this this particular photo here, it looks like we've got this uh, public meeting open house for uh, a, a bridge, the Darien Bridge, um, and I see the uh, the G dot uh, emblem there. So clearly, like in the situation that you just described, there you're you're looking for those opportunities to partner with the the DOTs, the South Carolina DOT and the Georgia DOT. How's that partnership? evolved over these years since you've been, you know, uh, on board with the Greenway. Uh, Do you guys feel like you're in in a good working relationship and things are starting to click now? (laughs) Yeah. When I first started, there was a fair amount of heavy blinking and expressionless stares of like, what, what is the Greenway? What are you talking about? (laughs) But um, through just persistence and the fact that it has been incorporated into all the comprehensive plans for every county, uh, that's on the coast, they they can't ignore it. And so it's been a little bit easier. We still have to push pretty hard on a project by project basis just to make sure that they're meeting our design standards because we do want this to be all ages and abilities, uh, not just for daredevil kind of roadies um, and, and long distance, you know, adventure cyclists. Um, although that's great, we want them to use it too, but we also want this to be something functional for people who live in that community. Maybe they only use a quarter mile of it for their kid to get to school. And we want to make sure that it's a facility that's appropriate for that as much as it's appropriate for, you know, a couple, uh, long distance running <laughs> the whole thing from Maine to Florida. Yeah. It's, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, it, it brings up this, uh, this particular image here and, and, and taking a look at this gentleman who uh, just completed a long distance route, as you just uh, talked about. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, Avery here. Yeah, so this is Avery. And just uh, about a week and a half ago, he reached the southernmost point as as shown there. And uh, as far as we know, he is the first person to even attempt, much less complete Uh, following the entire Greenway route by unicycle. Um, I got to meet up with him in Savannah, a really remarkable young man, 19 years old, um, 
<laughs> pretty cool too that there were so many news stories being generated just by how unique his adventure was. Uh, and he was intentionally raising money for the East Coast Greenway Alliance, which thank you very much, Avery, much appreciated. Uh, and that, that fundraising continues. Uh, he, he got roasted by Jimmy Fallon, not by name, but as uh, one of Jimmy Fallon's final jokes uh, about a week before he finished, he got referenced. And I won't ruin the joke. The delivery is better by Fallon, obviously. But um, the next day, we got permission from Avery to kind of share that. And he was like, this is the greatest day of my life. I've been roasted by Jimmy Fallon. You That's know? great. It was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, and to your point, though, you don't have to be like this adventure cyclist. You don't have to be somebody who's doing what Avery's doing of, you know, attacking a challenge. It can just be, you know, going out for, you know, a a utilitarian trip. It could be for recreation. It could be for your health. um, But it also could be just, you know, being able to get from one place to the next um, talk a little bit about that, because that's one of the recurring themes here on the Active Towns uh, podcast and on the Active Towns channel in general, is that our activity assets, these linear parks, if you will, these these pathways, um, these trails can serve multiple purposes. They're they're not they don't have to be just recreation. They can mm-hmm. actually serve uh, a utilitarian purpose. Talk a little bit about that from from your perspective and being able to communicate those benefits because there's a, a a much greater return on investment, you know, to an asset that gets built if it can be multidimensional. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I'm glad you bring that up. I mean, it has probably been the central communications challenge with uh, particularly the older guard engineers at the DOTs uh, and even at the county level that these kinds of multi-use paths, that it's both and not either or. This is both a transportation and a recreation facility and not either or. Yeah. And so conveying that and showing that that can be the case uh, has been ongoing work. And as people turn over, uh, certainly as younger engineers are coming in, it's been less of a challenge to communicate that. But I think there's just been a lot of siloed thinking for many decades and the pots of money that your state uh, DOTs compared to your departments of natural resources who might control a fund like recreational trails program where it's in the name, but then they've used, they've been picking from all these different pots of money to build the same kind of facilities that are meeting all of these needs. And certainly anywhere that the greenway runs through the exurbs, the suburbs, or any urbanized area, it's a critical part of the transportation infrastructure uh, for people walking, biking, using assistive devices, Um, But then also, as somebody might be biking from their neighborhood across the Intracoastal Waterway, as shown here in Myrtle Beach, to go to a drugstore or a grocery store, there might be somebody going for a run, you know, a strictly recreational activity. They're on the same facility at the same time. So it's it's both uh, are happening just with the same amount of concrete. Uh, yeah, so the reason why I pulled this uh, image up was just that. So thank you very much for, um, you know, blending that right into your discussion is, yeah, these are critical connections and they are multidimensional and and serve many different purposes. So there's that utilitarian role as well as that recreational role. And, uh, and, and really helping get past barriers. And that's exactly what this pathway does with this bridge is you're able to get past a water barrier, which is absolutely, you know, crucial and essential. Uh, so who's this smiley person? <laughs> this is my new uh, direct supervisor and our new national greenway director, Ms. Allison Burson, who's been with the organization a little less than a year. Uh, Allison comes to us with a tremendous amount of expertise and experience. She was an assistant to the mayor of Seattle for many years. Uh, and then uh, and, and uh, has a lot of uh, life experience growing up in and around Boston, but had never been to the Southeast before. So just a week ago, uh, I picked her up at the Charleston airport and we did a windshield slash walking and biking tour of all of the Greenway from uh, North Myrtle Beach at the North Carolina border all the way down to St. Mary's, Georgia uh, at the border with Florida. 
Yeah, that's great. I want to linger on this photo just for a, a moment longer because of the the sign here, of <laughs> and, and and pointing out that yes, these uh, trails, these pathways can be critical infrastructure, critical activity assets as part of parks. They could mm-hmm. literally be a linear park, but they could also run through a, a park, a regional park, a, a city park. And, and so uh, one of the things that, that I highlighted recently in a, in, a, in a video was the connectivity through the various parks in Amsterdam and how those are critical utilitarian commuter routes for people on bikes. But at the same time, again, serving those multiple purposes, it's, it's a park. And so mm-hmm. you, you right. get that, you know, you get that wellness aspect of it as, as well, but critically you're able to get away from automobile exhaust and noise into the trees. And so you do have that, that, you know, connection to nature, which is so incredibly important. So I wanted to just point that out with this one. Sure. And I feel like in our rural areas and and between the small towns in particular that, you know, we talked about adventure riding and that's great. I love it personally. Uh, Now that I've got younger kids, I'm a little more cautious uh, with my long distance riding. Uh, There's a lot more at stake, it feels like. And that's just the phase I am of my life. And I love these paths because they enable that kind of adventure while really mitigating the risks, the very serious risks that can come along with long distance bicycle touring. Uh, With these kind of paths of family with uh, kids who know how to ride, but you don't want them on the shoulder of a highway, right? They can still go on that two, three day adventure between state parks and and have this experience of a lifetime and this tremendous bonding, you know, uh, within the family and with friends uh, without having to, to to take on that you know significant risk of that that a lot of adventure cycling can have just as an inherent part of it. Right. Speak to this uh, image right here and uh, and really the significance and the context uh, you know of the trail as it exists in this particular location. Mm -hmm. So this is the very southern end of the city of Myrtle Beach. Uh, You can see over Allison's head out of focus, another blue green trailhead. So the previous image you showed uh, is the northern end of the city limits. And this is the southern end. So they've got just shy of 12 miles. Uh, Myrtle Beach, uh, to, to many people's surprise, is actually the first and so far only city to have completed 100% of their part of the East Coast Greenway. They were really enthusiastic about the vision when they learned about it in the 2000s. They had a lot of great local leaders who prioritized all the funding they had that could go to bike ped so that they could get the Greenway done in segments. So what you see here is we're at the end point of the multi-use path. And now you transition to the shoulder of that highway you can see over to the right. And it is a very abrupt transition from a really good facility to essentially no facility. Uh, And so we're working to get the path extended, but this is pretty emblematic of what if the the Greenway travel route, uh, which is kind of our temporary route we publish if somebody wanted to ride or walk from Maine to Key West as of today, we publish a route that shows all of our existing trails linked with the, and I'm emphatically using scare quotes here, safest available roads. Um, Sometimes there's only one road available, and in this case, it's U.S. Highway 17 uh, is the only publicly traversable highway between a lot of cities. And uh, it's a bear, and it's really scary in some parts. And we we go out of our way to let prospective long-distance users of the Greenway know that conditions fluctuate from really great to really terrifying. Uh, So you have to be prepared for that. And this, that picture really showcases that. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like we found a, a a bike rack here. (laughs) Yeah. So this is, this to me shows how these kinds of facilities can also activate local businesses, local business districts. This is right off of the West Ashley Greenway in the West Ashley neighborhood of Charleston. Uh, and we're on the back side, kind of where the dumpsters are of this shopping center over to the right. And there's a bakery. Uh, and they are really excited that people can come from all these neighborhoods along about a nine mile corridor. Uh, the asphalt multi use path is just off uh, picture uh, to the left. 
And, you know, they've got this colorful bike rack. It's clearly seen a lot of use. And uh, they're so excited about people showing up by bike that they provide locks that you can go grab at the bar uh, so in case you showed up without your own. Yeah, that's great. And then this, is across the trail, we saw these folks in their backyard, and uh, this was kind of down the embankment from the trail, and I noticed the sign, and they built their own gate so that they could access the trail directly from their own backyard, and uh, I said, wow, she, where'd you get this sign? She said, well, I used to work for the city of Charleston and was instrumental in getting this path funded way back when and I was and I'm so excited to live on it now and I had one of these old signs in my you know like office file cabinet that they put up some recognition of the greenway on their gate and I just love that people feel a lot of pride of place when they live next to a facility like this yeah 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 I'd like to say you know TOD trail oriented development and uh, uh, here here you have a trail oriented residence <laughs> I love it. That's right. That's right. That's great. And I, and I'm glad you mentioned that too, because I did notice that of the, the number of people who had properties abutting to the trail and putting their own gates in and, and really embracing that as a, a, a true asset, not only for the community, but also for them personally and being able to, you know, want to be able to have, have that easy access. Talk a little bit about that, because I think that's critical to the, uh, the magic of having a pathway, having a trail is having good connectivity. How are you sort of navigating that in, in terms of making sure that the, the connectivity is there so that you can maximize the utilitarian benefit? Mm -hmm. Planners certainly understand that and developers and in many other parts of the Greenway Corridor, Northeast and in Florida, you see those connections happening automatically. What I can tell you, and it's, it's getting better, but the nimbyism is strong in the Southeast. And what we have seen is this, in retrospect, humorous, but in the moment, deeply frustrating kind of story arc where a trail is proposed and maybe it's running behind people's property or in front of it, it's usually when it's behind that you'll get a plurality of people who say, absolutely no way, or I'll let you build this trail, but you have to, as the city or county, put up a 10 foot ugly chain link fence so that people don't come and steal my flat screen TV on their bike, which will put a We'll put a bookmark on that, a preposterous idea in the first place. Um, <laughs> but so a year or two will go by, and then all of a sudden you start seeing these emails coming in to that city or county council person saying, why is this fence here? Why do I have to go a mile out of my way to get to this trail that I can see from my back porch? And everybody just like rolls their eyes and pulls their hair out like, you all insisted on that barricade when this was being proposed, right? And then as soon as people see the trail, see that it's not filled with looting rioters, I don't know what they were imagining, right? But they see it's filled with happy families and their neighbors enjoying a walk with their dog or a ride with their grandkids. Then they all want to put in a gate and start building bridges, they want, literally yeah. and metaphorically, right? They want this. <laughs> they want that, exactly. So it often starts off with maybe a slight majority feeling very wary and suspicious, but then they come around and end up being the biggest champions. And what I would love, what would really save a lot of headache and time and hassle would be if we could just skip that unnecessary suspicion phase, <laughs> because all we have is mountains of proof from not just Georgia and South Carolina, but of course, places around the world, certainly around the country where every time one of these trails has been put in, it has been a net positive and a win, 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 uh, no matter what kind of factor or characteristic you're looking at. It's good for health. It's good for the climate. It's good for equity. It's good for access. It's good for people's mental health and well-being. Uh, and so if we could just go ahead and just scoot on past that resistance that's so unnecessary, uh, that would be great. That's my plea to the world right now. <laughs> And uh, in th this particular image, this this may not be of Savannah, but it, it certainly reminds me of the the images of of my stay in Savannah. 
Oh, very much. Yes, that was a recent part of the tour, uh, Allison there on the left, and we're with some local advocacy partners. Uh, to the right, really leading the tour is Kayla Brown, who's with our a wonderful partner organization of ours, Bike Walk Savannah, uh, which, as the name suggests, is the advocacy group for uh, bicycle and pedestrian issues in the city of Savannah. So that's one of the iconic squares there in the background. Uh, that, so it is Savannah. Uh, See? <laughs> oh, very much so. Yeah, I was correct. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And here's and here's another uh, you know view on the the waterway here. So. Getting back to your point, though, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that in terms of hoping to skip past that resistance phase. Reflect on it a little bit from, you know, from 2017 to now. Does it seem like things are moving faster? Do you, does it seem like, you know, it's not bogged down as much, uh, you know, in that resistance phase or, or is it moving quicker or is it still just is is difficult? It's not as difficult, ironically, as the the blip of the pandemic kind of showed us. It it reset a lot of municipal and county work. You know, projects got slowed down, um, and things weren't happening for a couple of years um, um, as they shouldn't have been. Um, but what people found during that time is that they really needed to be outside. They wanted to be outside, and having these kinds of linear parks were essential for everyone's sanity, mental and physical well-being. And so the resistance has softened and and now people are seeing like, no, this is a good thing. That's not a nice to have. This is a need to have. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you look at these these images that we're uh, scrolling through right here, and I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic is that, yes, I mean, that that was sort of like this this grand reset globally of just how important being able to have access to high quality outdoor activities for our mental health and, and that, and, and our physical health, being able to, to have access to places, safe places, beautiful places to be able to, to walk and bike and, and be able to get some fresh air and, uh, and, and being able to have access to beautiful scenes like this. Yeah, and this is unfortunately right now a bit of a cul-de-sac for the Greenway. It, it This is in St. Mary's, uh, the St. Mary's River. So across uh, the river is Florida, uh, and, and this is our southern boundary here. And uh, this is the departure point to go to Cumberland Island National Seashore, uh, which has a ferry, the only way to get to that uh, primeval island. Highly recommended if, if you've never been. Uh, feral horses, it's, it's just amazing. And... Right now, we're in a bit of a limbo waiting for a ferry service that will be roll-on, walk-on service, hopefully at least a couple of trips every weekday that will link St. Mary's and Fernandina Beach so that we can avoid having to route people a dozen miles to the west on US-17. If you were a lone or small group of touring cyclists right now, you would get to this point and be stuck without a fairly expensive private chartered boat or, you know, or unless you had your own kayaks with you and wanted to do that. Um, so we're waiting on some of these really key linkages to activate a lot of the greenway in some, in some key areas. You know, sometimes the barriers are, are nature uh, and sometimes they're man-made, right? We've, we've built interstates or freight rail. And in some cases we just have a lot of rivers we have to get across. Yeah. 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 Good point. Well, it's a beautiful cul-de-sac of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. As they go. Sure. <laughs> so this is meeting with the good folks of St. Mary's to talk about how we can get past that. This is uh, over my shoulder is Robert Bartow, who is my counterpart for Florida. He's our Florida coordinator. Uh, and then to the far right is a uh, city councilman, Dave Riley, uh, for city of St. Mary's. And they've already uh, dedicated money to subsidize that ferry service. And we're just getting some kind of logistical kinks worked out and fingers crossed the Alliance will be announcing the beginning of that ferry service very soon uh, so that that will go from a cul-de-sac on both sides to an hour long, gorgeous ferry ride that you can just roll your bike right onto and see dolphins and the feral horses on the Southern shores of Cumberland Island. Uh, I've done it as a charter and it's a really special experience. Wow, yeah, that's pretty amazing. You know, we 
mentioned a little bit of, you know, sort of that knee jerk reaction of nimbyism and, uh, you know, trying to, uh, or not, not trying to, I mean, there oftentimes it's based in fear. It's, it's based in a, a misperception of what is there and, and what might happen from it. Um, and you just mentioned, you know, city council member there, um, as part of that, this particular group. And I like to say that a trail and a pathway is something that, you know, all spectrums of the political, you know, world can actually get behind. Um, mm-hmm. they're just, the re- there's a, an incredible return on investment, you know, for, for trails and pathways. Uh, I can't remember. It might've been, uh, Keith Laughlin, uh, back when he was in charge of the, the rails to trails conservancy, you know, said to me, you know, Hey, a, a trail is something that everyone can get behind, you know, <laughs> regardless of their political leanings and, and spectrum. Uh, are you seeing that? Are you seeing, uh, you know, that sort of thing where it, you, you just it, right, left, you know, blue, red, you can just th- kind of throw all that out. I mean, anybody can get behind this concept of the East Coast Greenway. To, to an extent, uh, I, of course, want to be careful here. I mean, it, there's bipartisan support for seeing the trails on the ground and everyone loves to come out for the celebration and the ribbon cutting. Uh, where it falls apart is when you talk about the dedicated public investment uh, in these kinds of facilities and, you know, somewhat moving around through our budgets, some of our priorities about how we invest in transportation infrastructure. Um, and with a, a sliver, of course, of what we invest in highway widenings and maintenance for the interstate system, um, we could finish the entire greenway in a matter of a few years. Um, but not everybody agrees on that being a, a top priority. What's interesting, though, is that oftentimes I hear, re, you know, regardless of the political spectrum, a desire to have high quality parks, well maintained infrastructure. I mean, these are, you know, and suddenly you're like, okay, well, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Let's build really good stuff and let's maintain it well. So we need to, you know, budget that. And so, yeah, it, 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 I guess it's, it's the challenge of when it does come to, okay, budgeting the, the construction and budgeting the maintenance, uh, you know, that has to come from somewhere. So, Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of sticker shock. I mean, like everything with inflation and even during uh, the pandemic, we saw this with the supply chain issues. The price of concrete in particular was sky high. And so some of the estimates and and kind of scoping estimates that that communities saw for a mile or two of multi-use path, it raised some eyebrows for sure. But then, you know, I'm on the other side, I'm thinking like, okay, sure. But then no one's eyebrows are raised when the headline comes out that the $600 million highway interchange is now going to cost $850 million. Everyone just kind of shrugs and says, oh, that's the way it goes, right? So the, the disparity between acknowledging that just because this infrastructure costs a little bit more doesn't mean it's not worth doing, which we've fully internalized for major kind of highway projects. Yeah. And it looks like we do have a, a little bit of a ribbon cutting here. Or some yeah, sort of that's our executive director there in the middle. This was the ribbon cutting back in 2018, I believe, for that trailhead in Myrtle Beach. And it had... As you can see, people were really excited about it. State lawmakers, a lot of locals, and many advocates who had been working on this uh, project for years. You know, very gratifying to them to see this finally happen. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and here's a a, a great shot, too, of, you know, exemplifying what we were talking about earlier is that, yeah, sometimes it's it's not a trail through the middle of, of nature. Sometimes it is, you know, a, you know, wider shared use path, multi-use path, uh, along a roadway, how much of the, the length would you predict or estimate will end up being something like this, the South Carolina and, uh, the Georgia, um, you know, sector. 
The coast of Georgia is extremely rural. Uh, eight out of 10 Georgians live four hours away in the greater metro Atlanta area. Uh, so unlike a lot of the East Coast states, our population center is not coastal. Um, uh, it's a little different in, in South Carolina. So I'd say probably 60% is going to look like that in South Carolina and more like 80% in Georgia, just because the mainland coast is uh, not very populated. Uh, beautiful uh, national forests and protected wilderness areas. So it's very quiet, uh, but there just aren't a lot of population centers in coastal Georgia. And then we can pull that last picture up. There's um, it's pretty clever uh, of this town. So this is in St. Mary's. Uh, that's the city councilman there on the right, Dave Riley, who was in that restaurant picture. And uh, you can see the two tones of pavement. So this was St. Mary's is a very small city that doesn't have a huge infrastructure budget. Uh, they already had sidewalk along this local road, and they wanted to meet the East Coast Greenway's design standards, uh, which are AASHTO standards and ACTO standards for a multi-use path, you know, 10 feet. So they just doubled the width of their sidewalk. And, and we're able to create a 10 foot multi-use path that people could safely pass each other, ride side by side conversationally. Um, so I thought that was a really clever way to work with what you've got, right? You don't have to go build a brand new trail that requires all kinds of, you know, substrate construction and uh, things like that. It's like, they've already got this right of way. The city already owns it. There's already five feet there. Let's just double the width. And now we've got ourselves a multi-use path in a very small town. I'm really glad you mentioned that too, because, you know, that's one of the, the easy things that you can do. I mean, talk about decreasing some costs. You don't have to go through all the same level of, uh, you know, perseveration over, uh, studies and, um, it, it, it's like, like you said, and, and it's, you know, a, a higher, and efficiency in terms of just being able to, to say, Hey, we're just going to expand this and widen this. And, uh, I'm assuming that 10 feet is your, your minimum, uh, width. Um, in a very rural area, we will allow it to go down to eight feet, but that's very specific to highly rural areas where you're not expecting a tremendous amount of traffic. Um, those sections of trail would be linkages really between populated areas. Uh, but certainly in an urban area, 10, 12, even 14 feet, depending on how, how densely populated it is and how many people you could expect to use it on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people are oftentimes asking me how wide their multi-use paths should be. And I say wider. <laughs> right. <laughs> because if you make it, if you build it well, people will use it and then it will just get more popular from there. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also say if it's going to be a, a, a paved, you know, if it's going to have a paved section, uh, include um, on either side or on at least one side, uh, an area of uh, crushed aggregate um, or softer surface, natural surface uh, for runners, because honestly, you know, folks who are running will, I, I would prefer to be on the natural surface versus the, um, you know, the, the paved surface. And so you're able to actually uh, get even more bang for your buck out of that, mm -hmm. you know, that real estate by, you know, having that, you know, 10, 12, 14 foot paved section, and then another, you know, four feet or whatever of natural surface. So that's just, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, it, you have, uh, you know, gravel bike riders, mountain bike riders who would just prefer a little bit of texture. Uh, and then, you know, kind of specific maybe to the, the deep South is you've got folks who are riding horses as well, uh, oh, in some of point. these areas. And yeah, it would absolutely be a, a useful horse trail. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we are on street. So talk a little bit about how that this is handled. Yeah, so this is in downtown Savannah. This was a ribbon cutting from a few years ago for the bike lane already existed. Um, this is one of our north-south corridors uh, to get the major one used by bicycle commuters, including myself. And uh, they finally painted it green. They did not make it physically protected or buffered, but they did add the green paint, which I can tell you has significantly cut down on how many out-of-town tourists are driving in the bike lane, which was a really big problem before. Uh, ironically, because the bike lane was such a generous width, 
people saw it as a narrow car lane <laughs> and we're <laughs> using it uh, to pass people. So the green paint has really helped. Um, we want every foot of the greenway to be physically protected, but our advocacy, we have short and medium term goals as well for an urban street. If, if this is part of where people are traveling through Savannah, if we can make the bike lane that's there even marginally safer by adding green paint, then that's something we want to celebrate uh, as the Greenway and as uh, the advocacy group in Savannah did. And then on rural highways, if we can get, you know, two or three feet of usable smooth pavement to the outside of the lane, uh, that's not being interrupted by those rumble strips, then we're going to call that a win as well, while we're still working long term to get that 8, 10, 12 foot multi use path incorporated into their budget for, you know, 5, 10, maybe 15 years from now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here's another treatment uh, option that we have here as well. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> no this is kind of suburban. Yeah, this yeah. is Myrtle Beach and this is outside of a big gated community. Uh, but, you know, and, and you can see a kind of restricted access state highway over to the right. Um, so a lot of these trails are weaving connective tissue. I mean, Myrtle Beach's land use certainly I wouldn't call particularly urban in its orientation. It's extremely car centric, uh, but they have managed to thread a multi-use path through all of that uh, with a lot of creativity. Um, and so they have managed to be, like I said, the first city uh, to complete all of their part of the Greenway, mostly through political will and, and the vision that this would be a popular thing for not only residents, but the millions of tourists who come there with beach cruiser bikes strapped on the back of their car. Um, you know, and they want that experience of riding on the beach and having a safe way to go get a, you know, an ice cream cone while they're on vacation with the family. It, it brings up a, a, an idea in my mind, too, that many communities could like see uh, an advantage of being able to develop their own off street network of pathways and trails to connect to the, the East Coast Greenway. Are you all you know, actively working with and, and helping, uh, you know, encourage that connectivity so that, uh, so, so that it's not just the East coast greenway going through the community, but there's a amplification of the connectivity. Yeah. It's uh, not to belabor the analogy, but it really is a spine and ribs kind of a situation. And particularly where we're going through any populated area, we have seen the greenway, inspire those cities to develop a more robust bike ped network that is utilizing the East Coast Greenway, which is, of course, traveling north south through these cities and areas uh, they want to build off of it. So Mount Pleasant, uh, a city adjacent to Charleston, they've got a network that they have dubbed the Mount Pleasant Way much of which is the East Coast Greenway spine route, but the rest of it are these equally important and essential connections to places of business, places of employment, neighborhoods, schools, all the destinations and trip generators you can think of. Uh, in Savannah, similar endeavor called Tide to Town, which is a 30 mile figure eight uh, network of multi-use paths, which Thinking about leveraging the resources you have, Savannah realized that it's sitting on this gold mine of publicly owned historic canals that have these beautiful, already flat uh, 18 to 20 foot right of ways at the top of these canal embankments that are weaving their way within and between neighborhoods. And it's just ready made to put down a concrete multi use path, benches, lighting, interpretive signage. Uh, and it, it's just sitting there ripe for the picking to be turned into a, a, a paved path network. Uh, and much of it is also the greenway, but a lot of it is also just those essential connections to get people from where they are to where they need to want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I could imagine, you know, like in the case of, of, of that uh, example of being able to really exemplify, you know, the wayfinding, you know, so I could see like, you know, Savannah being like, okay, the tide to town and we're going to be, you know, branding that as, as well as branding it as a, and, and having the wayfinding signs to be able to connect to the, the greenway. So I could totally see that mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. We like to have this, this consistent signage, 
um, so that if you're following the Greenway route, you're going to see these signs. Um, not everywhere. Some places are more amenable to the signage being installed uh, or, or they don't want to pay for it. Sometimes we encounter that. And so the organization has to raise those funds to get the posts and the contractors. But we have signed a lot of the route and certainly all the sections that are on multi-use path. You'll see that telltale uh, tree and reflection emblem that lets you know, you know, you're on this long distance corridor. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And talk a little bit about the funding of of the Greenway. How are you all funded? Uh, we're a membership based nonprofit organization that is also generously supported by a lot of foundations uh, from throughout the entire uh, 15 state corridor and uh, a lot of private donors as well. And we've just launched our first uh, planned giving initiative that has already seen some success of folks who are, you know, in their uh, sunset years and are really big fans of this kinds of visionary project. And they want to make sure that we're part of their their planned giving objectives. And we're, you know, so grateful. So we're really putting together a, a diversified portfolio of of public and private support to, to keep the organization strong and growing. We've been able to add a lot of staff in the last few years, uh, and that's allowed us to be that much more effective. It's an, an avalanche in the best possible sense of the term at this point. Yeah, yeah. As we uh, bring this to a close, are there any final thoughts that you'd really like to leave the audience with? Sure. I mean, while the East Coast Greenway Alliance is uh, laser focused on completing the 3000 mile East Coast Greenway, uh, we see uh, an opportunity for the whole country to really take advantage of this moment, this infrastructure moment. And there's so much more funding available through the federal infrastructure bill, but a lot of people need assistance to access those funds in a timely way. So we've launched a new initiative called Greenways for All uh, that is truly nationwide in scope. Uh, so greenwaysforall.org. We also have a Greenways for All uh, Twitter account. And this is a great place, a resource to come and work about, uh, learn about why uh, Greenways are valuable to communities, to individuals, for economic development, personal health, and, and all kinds of points in between. And then as importantly, how to access these infrastructure funds so that your community can connect its own Greenways, plan, design, and construct them moving forward. Fantastic. That's great. And I just happen to have that website ready to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I love what it when a plan to. works. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Brent, it has been such a pleasure uh, reconnecting with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks so much for having me, John. It was my pleasure. Hey, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Brent Bice. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, it really means a lot to me and helps the channel out a great deal. I'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>